Admiral in writing about St. Columba is very concerned to link Columba vicariously with Patrick. Now, if you know a bit about the story of the cult of St. Columba, this isn't entirely intuitive. It was actually right up around that part of Ireland where the holy mountain was that I mentioned, up around Schlieve Lee. There was a lot of competition between the churches of Patrick and the churches of Columba. They were both northern churches. Patrick's church was centred on Armagh in the uh, sort of eastern side of what is now the province of Northern Ireland. Columbus Church was up in Donegal, to the north of what is now Derry. And there was competition between these two for territory, for influence. They were rivals. But the Church of St. Columba always knew that Patrick came first. You know, you might have rivalry, but there's also respect. You know, there's a knowledge of the early founders and the importance of Patrick as a figure of the 5th century, a figure who came into Ireland and was a foundational figure, is very important. Now, if you read the lives of St. Patrick, written in the 7th century and later, Patrick is conceived as a figure with a strong narrative of the baptism of nations. He goes to the hill of Tara, and he baptises the nation as part of his conversion of King Loigera. There is this idea, in a sense, that Patrick has this strong imagery then, of Ireland as a nation, and him as a figure who brought Christianity through an act of baptising that as a unitary space. All of that would be just hagiography, but unlike with St. Columba and St. Brendan, we actually have Patrick's own account of what he thought he was doing, which is different, naturally enough, to what his hagiographers talking about later on. Different, but not entirely different, because the hagiographer read the confession, but naturally enough, there were things about the church in the time of the hagiographers that were different to the church in the time of Patrick. But if you're ever going to read any text from early medieval Ireland, or indeed from the first millennium, Patrick is Pretty good. I'll give you a contextualising point that Peter Brown was probably the, you know, the, the canonical historian now of late antiquity, the living historian who more than anyone else has defined our approaches to the late antique period. He said, you know, that he's written about the holy man and the idea of the holy person as time has gone on and we have to get you know, more inclusive there. He's talked about holy people. He said that the canonical idea of the holy man he created in a way as a figure of influence in late antiquity, he said, you know, looking back on it, he said, I never thought much about the inner life of the holy man. And he said, I then thought really, you know, how would I discover the inner life of the holy man? And then Peter Brown said to himself, I'm from Ireland, actually, and there's St. Patrick. Patrick writes about his own inner life, his interior spirituality, the way in which living his life changed him in his life in the world and his interior vision of the religious life. Now in this text, he also has a very strong theme about nations and the baptism of nations. And uh, my friend Tom O'Loughlin, who's the book I've got here, uh, in a number of studies, has picked this up very strongly and pointed out how much not only is Patrick himself strongly concerned with the theme that the baptism of Ireland the Irish, is in a sense possibly a journey on the edge of the world, a journey in one of the last nations, but also how much is hard the obvious pick up and develop that idea. And I would say you add to that also this passage about where Adam Norton of Iona was talking about Columba and Patrick. We are in the same journey here. And I would say, reasonable confidence that our monks who were travelling in the ocean in the 700s, who were perceiving their journey in somewhat apocalyptic terms, are at least indirectly thinking back to an agenda that was set by the foundational uh, figure in Irish sainthood, and that is St. Patrick. However ignorant I am, he has heard me, so in these late days, you know the same symbolism there, I can dare to undertake such holy and wonderful work. In this way, I can imitate somewhat those in the Lord foretold who would announce his gospel in witness to all the nations. This is what we see as being fulfilled. Look at us. We are witnesses. The gospel has been preached right out to where there is nobody else there. 
Again he says, go therefore to the whole world and announce the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptised will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. And yet again, the gospel of the kingdom will be announced all over the world as testimony to all the nations, and then will come the end. That last phrase, I think, Matthew 24. Patrick, Patrick is one of those people who can talk scripture. You know, I mean, when he's writing, he just drifts in and out of it. Which is the mark, in many ways, of a preacher, a sort of front-line missionary preacher. He really has those things in his vocabulary. I'm sure he writes in many ways like he would have preached. He must have been a very interesting man to listen to. But his theme is the world will end soon. And we who are living in Ireland are preaching the gospel to where it has never been before. And that's pretty interesting. We're colonising the edges. We've come to, what does Isaiah say, the coasts where my word is not known. That theme can be traced through much of the imagery of the desert. So the desert is not just a place where these people are going. There's an empty place where we can find God because we're in the desert. We all know in the Bible that's where you find God. Go back to the very earliest, uh, earliest encounters with God. God lives in the desert in a way. Rather, you go into the desert, you find God. The desert is more than that in this case. The desert is also not just a place where you find solitude. It's not just a selfish or an introspective place in a way. I don't mean those in any negative sense. The desert is also part of a story, which is that Christianity is not known necessarily in all parts of the desert. And if you put our footprint there, well, that last line perhaps says it. Maybe the end will come. So, we'll finish just with where we were before. <coughs> Columba was a disciple of the holy Bishop Patrick, prophesied thus about patron, in the last years of the world, a son will be born. In other words, what we have here is a direct continuity of the ideas of Patrick, traceable into Columba and his spirituality, at least as Adam Norm represents it. That we can trace further into the story of St. Brendan and these other saints in the ocean.